Zuganru is inspired by the passenger pigeon and its ultimate extinction. Um, the passenger pigeon is, or was, before it went extinct, indigenous to North America, and it is a bird that was known for its great migrations. These birds would fly in flocks of millions upon millions of birds. They would darken the skies for days, and um, then they went extinct, uh, actually, with Martha, who was the last known surviving passenger pigeon. Um, she died on September 1st, 1914, 100 years ago. So this piece is really about um, about a species that could go from millions upon millions of birds down to just one and then zero. Zuganru is a term that I came across when I was a research fellow at the Smithsonian. I was an artist research fellow about six years ago. And I came down to the Smithsonian to um, research migration, bird migration specifically. Because as, as an artist, I work with themes of loss and extinction and our desire to recover. And I look to natural history, stories in natural history that lend themselves to those themes. When I was um, learning about migration, I came across this term, Zuhunru. And it's a term that is devised, was devised to describe the restlessness that migratory species exhibit prior to migration. And I was just really interested in this idea that there's this something that's innate within this species that um, needs to go, needs to migrate, needs to move. And so that uh, term was what I titled this work. Um, the piece itself, I would say, is structured to respond to or relate to the restlessness described in the term Zuganru on a couple of different levels. Um, what I've done is to construct this seven-sided large um, display device, I would call it. It's, it's a multi-sided um, vitrine, which is uh, covered with a two-way mirror. And what happens with this two-way architectural mirror is that as the viewer walks around it and as light plays off of it, what happens is that the tree and the birds that are placed within it multiply in reflection and then also disappear. So it is something that really makes the work active. It also makes the work um, interactive with the viewer. And it also, I would say, makes the story interactive with the piece, this idea of the story of loss and recovery. So it's a, this is about a memory that none of us have because none of us were alive in 1914. So it's conjuring a memory which was, which really is only available to us through stories um, and sightings that were recorded by people like Audubon and the great naturalists of the age. So the, the interactivity was something that was very important to me of this piece, that as viewers walk around, they can conjure the image of a forest filled with trees that are just overrun with migratory passenger pigeons. Um, that are only cast in a material that is obviously not a bird itself, it's cast off of a bird um, in amber. Amber is a material that I've used for a, a number of years and it's a material that, like many of the other materials I do, kind of lends itself to these stories of loss and recovery. We all know from stories like Jurassic Park that it is a material that because of its physical properties it can preserve small things that get embedded within it. And, and for those of you who don't know, amber is a material that comes from natural tree resin that is basically fossilized over years. So as it oozes from a tree or did millions of years ago, it might have coated an insect or a piece of leaf or sometimes even very small animals, and then, um, and then hardening over time, preserving that specimen for time immemorial. So it's a material that, um, for various reasons, has a mythology that talks about um, loss and recovery, something coming back, possibly regenerating something. So I use it to make reference to that. But I also use it again for this, um, its physical properties in terms of how it interacts with light. So when it's lit in a particular way, those birds really kind of illuminate, almost as if they have a kind of life within them, which then gets lost as you walk further and the light hits it another way. Blue is a new work of mine in which I cast two large crystal uh, spheres or globes, we can call them. Um, and what I did was to cast off of songbirds, um, the bodies of songbirds, which then make a negative impression within these what appear to be solid uh, crystal spheres. How I came to this piece is really through the color blue, and it came from my research on uh, birds. What I learned while I was down at the Smithsonian, again on this research fellowship, was that um, the blue in bird feathers 
uh, for a long time it's been understood that the blue and bird feathers comes from a, it's a structural color and as opposed to a pigmented color. And I was really interested in the idea that um, these feathers are a structural color, but what I was really interested in as well is that crystal um, has the ability to create the structural color. And I should explain what a structural blue is. It's a blue that is that comes from what's called light scattering. So um, it's what makes the sky blue. And light scattering is is a is a I guess it's a phenomenon in which very tiny particles are suspended within the sky or within a clear material, and those tiny light particles allow all of the spectra of light from the sun to pass through with the exception of the blue spectra. The blue spectra hit those particles and bounce back, making blue visible, but all the other spectra pass through unseen, except at sunset. When the angle of the sun changes, what's happening is we're seeing the light that's passing through those particles as opposed to the blue that's bouncing back and those are the longest rays which are our light longest spectra which are reds and golds and yellows so that's what makes sunset so I was really struck by the fact that bird feathers and crystal and the sky share this ability to create structural color and so that was the, the beginning of this work that I started on with the crystal. So I started a, about a year and a half project where I just was trying to make structural blue. And then I've also discovered that bird feathers do have both pigmented and structural colors that work together to make these intense blues that, that, uh, that birds have in their, in their feathers. Um, so the pieces that you see in this exhibition are the result of all of this research working with both structural blue and pigmented blue. What I decided to do was to cast off of the bodies of songbirds, and um, and that was inspired by the indigo bunting, which is this intense blue songbird. It's a migratory bird as well, um, and that bird has significance to me because of its color, its uh, its migration um, patterns, but also because it's a bird that was really significant in the earliest advances in the '60s in migratory bird research, and. Um, so there's a lot of information to that that I won't tell you now, but they, that what's significant here was just that it was a bird that's, that kept coming back as a point of interest for me while I was doing my research, both material research and information research. Um, so these crystal spheres are filled with what are actual negative impressions of the bird bodies of these songbirds. And the way that the, they read is as they look like a positive, as you look through the meat of the material, through this uh, about two, three inches of crystal, to then see the bodies of the birds, which are, as I said, negative impressions within. So they create a hollow space within these spheres that otherwise appear solid. And, um, and what I wanted was for the birds to kind of read there are some that are closer to the surface and some that are further away from the surface. And I wanted them to read almost like a topographic um, map within these globes or spheres. I have two spheres. One is a lighter blue, which is that signifies the day sky, the sky in the day. And then there's one that's a much darker blue, which is signifying the sky at night. That also goes back to the fact that the indigo bunting is a nighttime migrator which had a lot of significance in migratory bird research as well. Um, so I guess the pieces really are about this relationship that birds, and particularly migratory birds, have in terms of the, the relationship of the terrestrial and the celestial. And I was really interested in that idea, that space that exists between earth and sky and the birds somehow, they both can, they can navigate both and they become this kind of entity that signifies both.